kicked us off with what was the idea behind the project and what, were, what, what did you go in thinking? What was your, your plan? Um, yeah, you know, it, it has evolved over the <laughs> many years that we were working on this project, but um, the idea was really to explore um, this movement of women of color who are transforming American politics. I mean, women of color have always been the backbone of social movements in the United States, but um, in this particular moment, starting not just in 2018, but in 2018 when we filmed, um, looking at candidates and organizers to create this movement um, that is you know, resonating in so many ways was really uh, one of our main goals. Talk me through, Marge, if you will, the, and I hope everybody on this panel is okay with first names um, as we do this. Is that all right with everybody? Sure. Fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Marge, if you would walk, walk me through the, the, the strategy behind the intentionality around looking at women of color. And what did you go in thinking ahead of time? And what did you come out thinking on the back end? I mean, for us, it was incredibly important that we center both race and gender while telling what we consider a sort of epic American political story. Um, we think that you can't really look at what's happening in this country right now and truly understand it with an astute point of view without centering both race and gender. Um, and, and we were interested in using sort of this exploration of the lack of reflective leadership we have and the issues that keep us up at night. And, you know, unfortunately, it is a truth that when you uh, look at, you know, outcomes in this country, whether it's health or education or economic well-being, you know, when you intersect race and gender, that's where you see the poorest outcomes across our community. So we wanted to be able to find a way to access that point of view. Um, and frankly, we wanted, we had great intentionality about this idea of the emerging new American majority. You know, we're on this incredible moment of demographic shift, rapid demographic shift in this country. Um, and representation is a problem sort of across the board, right? So yes, in leadership, in government, in boardrooms, in newsrooms, Soledad, I'm sure you will agree that there's a problem of representation what? in the <laughs> What? And no, in the documentary no, industry. don't be crazy, don't be crazy. It, yeah, I mean, the thing is, we have to change um, the points of view through which we learn and understand our stories ourselves, and in this case, our legislation and our policy. So um, from the beginning, it was abundantly clear, and we were unapologetic about squarely centering race and gender in front of and behind the camp. You mention um, epic political stories, and of course, state of Georgia comes to mind and the, the city of Detroit comes to mind and California comes to mind, obviously well chosen for your project. I'm going to uh, start with uh, Congresswoman Tlaib, if I may, can I, may I call you Rashida? We don't know each other well of enough. Of course. Thank no, you. I, you know, my, even my residents call me Rashida. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, so you, we just heard Marge talk about representation and I'd be very curious uh, about how you think about representation and how you think it has influenced certainly what you've done politically, but also at people who are coming behind you as well. Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important uh, so, for so many of us. Yes, we're absolutely proud of our diversity, but I think it's our lived experiences that we bring for as women of color um, and these experiences of being African American women, uh, being a Muslim uh, right now in America, Latina. And so it is those lived experiences that we bring with us. And that's what we love the most. I mean, we really don't run to be the first of anything. Uh, we, don't, uh, we don't really want to be the first. Um, what we want to do is to bring the sense of urgency that we think is, has been lacking um, in some of these spaces around really important issues to women and, uh, that look like us, uh, that have experienced uh, some of the challenges that we've uh, continued to experience right now across the country. That's what I, I kind of look at it from that lens versus uh, you know, more transactional. It really is because it's important that, like for me, I know all levels of government, uh, it's important that we, you know, see people and, and hear them in a way uh, uh, that I don't think the people felt that way. And it's because of our experiences that we bring, our lived experiences that we bring forward that makes us, uh, you know, have that empathy and lead with compassion. Senator uh, Durazo, if I can call you Maria Elena, and appreciate that. Um, I'm curious with your background and all the work that you've done in sort of organizing and working with labor movements, have you felt that, that there is a sense of more political power over the last 
let's say five or 10 years for people who, are, who you represent? Yes, well, anyway, I also wanna thank the um, makers of this film. Uh, I'm really excited that having put us all together and all these uh, powerful experiences, but um, I would say that, you know, my life experience as being a migrant farm worker in California and a family of 11 kids with my parents came over from Mexico to today, uh, you know, the, the issue of domestic workers. Why can't these women be included when it comes to health and safety laws? You know, garment workers are still fighting to be paid. They're averaging $5 an hour because there's so much wage theft in that industry. So to me, this is all about connecting and making sure we are doing, making the change that will make a difference in their lives because they deserve so much more than what they get as women in industries that are predominantly women, uh, in industries that are just uh, ignored and super exploited. Um, so I'm really, I'm really glad that I had not only life experience as the family of immigrants, but also the life experience as a union organizer that together the collective power of all these women has got to make a difference when it comes to public policy. Usually when someone does a doc on a campaign, it actually doesn't feature the collective power of organizing, um, I, right? It's the star, there's a star, that star is the, kind of the center of the doc and everybody is in that person's orbit. So, um, and say, I'm gonna start with you, but then I'm gonna ask our directors to hop back into this. I think in some ways, maybe media generally has served the American public badly in not letting people understand how important local elections are, um, how important the school board is, how important sort of being politically active in your own backyard really is. Can you talk about the time we're in right now and some of the opportunities and some of the obstacles you're seeing in say? You. <laughs> A hundred days of this and you would think. You would think. <laughs> Don't you have your PhD in Zoom yet? What, right. come on. Right. You would think. Um, I, no, I couldn't agree more. I think that, um, you know, the moment that we're in right now, you are seeing the sort of synapses firing and the dots being connected in the minds of young people, but also just ordinary citizens. I think that, you know, people who are having real conversations about policing now understand that, you know what, the mayor actually has a lot of power in this particular situation, as does my city council person. And guess what? They are required by law to live in my community. So these are people that you can reach out and touch and have important conversations with. I think that um, the media has not served us well uh, in having these conversations prior to now. It's often about the horse race and the sexy race and whatever drama uh, is surrounding the actual election elections themselves and not really about, you know, the world that we want to live in and the policies and the politics uh, of this particular moment. Um, I, as an immigrant, I, these are things that uh, I had to learn myself and that I teach my family because, quite frankly, they also are not taught in our schools. Um, and so, you know, I'm really, I was while I wasn't initially super excited to have cameras follow me, because that's just weird, uh, the opportunity to show how we are using culture to connect those dots in the hearts and in the minds and to capture the attention of young voters and people who are new to this process, um, or the newly woke, <laughs> uh, I think is uh, is one that like, I, I, I could, I, I could not have understood how important it was at the time. Uh, and looking back, it was brilliant. Well, let's go back to our brilliant directors then. And uh, Marge, I'll start with you. And then Grace, I'll have you weigh in. Um, that's a very uh, interesting strategy. I and mean, it's always fun to have someone who says, "Ugh, I don't want cameras following me. <laughs> They're going to be the centerpiece of your, your project. Um, why focus, why make organizing the star? I mean, why not? Right? I mean, I feel, first of all, I think that one of the things that's really noteworthy about all the, the electeds, now electeds that we followed, is they also all were organizers before, right? None of that, this is, it's like a progression, right? There's like a spectrum, and from, they've moved from organizing to governance now, but they bring all that organizer that, that is, it, they were forged in organizing, right? And so 
I don't think there there is that much of a distinction. But honest to goodness, it's exactly what you said, Soledad. We have had our heads turned as a country by the person at the podium. And we put, we endow everything into this, you know, that one person at the podium. But nobody can win their elections without the NSAs and the Veronicas and in Rashida's case, the Thieves and the Andes. Like they need their organizing teams around them, their field teams. And, and those, you know, our little internal shorthand is these are the hidden figures of the movement. And we think that we have to, I mean, NSA is to as brilliant and strategic and powerful and, you know, really insightful as anyone else. And so why not foreground them? And why not let us, let the audience or let America see what does it really take to win an election? These things don't just happen, right? I mean, it's a phenomenal amount of work. And the more we're all fully aware of what the civic process actually looks like, then the more we can step into the power that we actually have within that process. So it, for us, it, they, they feel equally weighted in, in the story we're telling. Um, Marge, you did a really great job, but I would just add that, um, you know, nobody can do this alone. I mean, they're not, you know, messiahs who have come to save us. It's a, it's a ecosystem of people who are putting things to, you know, you, you may not be the one who wants to run for office, but you could be the person that could, you know, help the campaign. And, you know, one quick backstory, I never thought about politicians or politics as something that was remotely close to me until actually I was working on another kind of more traditional historical project about women in politics a few years ago. And I met Rashida, who was a state representative. And for the first time, I actually saw somebody who, you know, I could relate to somebody who was, you know, from the Midwest, daughter of immigrants, mother of young children, rooted in her community. And it sort of switched the light bulb on for me for a politician. And then to see all the people around her and, and in all of these different campaigns who are just like, regular folks like living in the neighborhood. That's what got me excited about the, the movement, telling a story about a movement. We, um, you guys use the, the phrase hidden figures, which um, I love, but also it's like they shouldn't have been hidden. So I sort of don't love <laughs> as an analogy. Um, Rashida, if I can ask you though on that, um, talk to me about some of the challenges that are particular to women of color. And then uh, uh, Marielena, I might have you weigh in as well, right? Because I mean, off the top of my head, I'm thinking, well, money. Well, we already know that women of color make yeah. less to start with. Uh, so I, you're already starting behind. Talk to me about some of the obstacles and then some of the opportunities. Yeah, I mean, I you still struggle right now. Um, uh, I walk into a room and, uh, you know, you're not seen the same way. Or uh, I will say something and no one would acknowledge it. But then another person white male will say the same exact thing. Uh, and uh, all of a sudden we're gonna do something on poverty. I was like, I've, I've been saying <laughs> we should do something about poverty. Um, but it's really hard also when you're running for office. Um, I, I just recall people uh, wanting to know more about you know, my resume. Oh, oh, you're a lawyer, okay. Then all of a sudden, like I actually think being a mom and being the eldest of 14 probably best prepared me to be as effective as I am now. Uh, more than my law degree, more than uh, it was the organizing. It was being part of the community. It was honestly, you know, when you become a mom, there's something happens. I'm, I'm like the mama bear now and I protect people. And so I, I feel like that to me was more um, uh, the traits that I wanted people to see. And, and, and that doesn't happen, I think, with women of color. And it's hard, you know, when I go and call and ask people for money, I mean, I was told by someone that said, you know, go ahead and give her money. She's just not going to win. Or, um, you know, do you really think uh, this is even possible? And, you know, and I think those are like, you know, whatever demons that people are going through where, you know, of course they want to see somebody like me in Congress. Many of the people I'm calling to ask for resources and money and support. Uh, but they also, you know, some of them have lost faith. Uh, that is even possible. And it's almost like, um, I remember, I don't know if I told Grace afterwards, I, I felt like, uh, when I even when I got to DC or even when I got to certain spaces uh, as, as I was running for office um, people wanted me to dress a certain way or look a certain way uh, you know do you always have to wear the gym shoes you know <laughs> um, you know it's all these kinds of things that uh, you know I think other women go through too but uh, my mentor Steve once I told him I said I'm so frustrated I just feel like uh, you know people don't hear me and he goes there are going to be people out there Rashida that will never hear you the same way many of us do uh, and that's just the reality of you being a child of immigrants, for you to be passionate. 
Um, because another man can be angry and can say the same thing I do, but won't be dismissed as me being emotional or, oh, that's just, you know, her deal. But it's this constant discrediting that happens um, that I know Mary Elena and, and I even think Ense probably walks into rooms with the political party in, in Georgia and feels the same way um, that, you know, her knowledge and, and her lens uh, is not as valued. Uh, but, you know, I, I would have never have been able to do this, but for those that did believe and have the faith of the possibility of someone like me serving in the United States Congress. Maria Elena, I have to imagine that um, when you come from a, a family of farm laborers in the state of California, and right now the, the, the framing of people who work in the fields is so hostile and so negative and anti-immigrant across the board anyway, and we could go off on a complete tangent about this, but I'm curious, so funding's an issue and feeling like, you know, maybe you're not seen and you're not heard. Did you have those similar issues? Were there other obstacles and how did you overcome them and how should others overcome them? Well, I think another challenge um, in terms of the culture, uh, the, the culture clash is, uh, I remember being asked a lot of times, what are you going to do? What are you, you, you? And there's a, there's a focus when you run for office on the one candidate. And what I'm used to is, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We, we, we. And um, it was really difficult to engage in conversation when people are thinking differently about where is the change going to come from? How is the change going to happen? And the change is not going to happen by electing one person. That person has to be, an, uh, has to be the kind of person that represents the community's struggles, not elect me and I'm going to solve all the problems for the community. Elect me and you don't have to worry about homelessness or workers' rights. That's, that's not what I'm used to. And I think that most women who, are, who come out of the roots of struggle don't believe that one, that one candidate is going to solve it. Um, it's, got to be, it's got to be all of us. So I, I kept ha finding myself trying to respond that way when people have become used to what are you going to do? And, and that's not what we, that's not the way we're going to change the system in this country is based on a lot of individuals. It's based on those individuals representing parts of a bigger movement that's going to give us the power to, to change. Uh, and say um, the media often focuses on the sort of the big national story, but I feel like when we look in the streets, we're seeing in every state and <laughs> 200 cities, the local right. political story play out not the big national, you know, horse racy type story. Right. Um, absolutely. So one, I'm going to just chime in on the previous question. And that's why I think that mamas and organizers make the best candidates and the best elected officials, because there's a clarity about the fact that it's not me, it's we. Um, I think that there's a, it is a weakness. Like I love when we have sort of dynamic, brilliant, charismatic candidates that like everybody wants to have a beer with, but it's also a weakness, right? Because if they get found in a hotel room or if they take a vote that people don't like, then does everything that we've worked for fall apart, right? So the idea that having people, the changing the culture of elections um, and changing the culture of politics and policy, uh, it's really difficult to do in the sort of time constraint of a campaign. And so how do we constantly have these conversations? How do we change the culture and the conversations around politics um, and again policy? Um, and then again as it relates to the media narrative, um, I think it's really really important um, it, and so talking about the single charismatic sort of messianic figure that we all want to vote for and support as well. It's also equally dangerous to focus on the one like tyrannical, uh, authoritarian, um, you know, 
orange <laughs> uh, figure who we all want to get out of the paint, right? Because ultimately it was never about him. Um, and I think that folks are starting to see that and understand that in this moment. And I, I think it's a combination of a couple of things, right? Decades, decades of racial justice organizing, gender justice organizing, labor organizing, et cetera. I think it's also one of the, if, if I could, I feel weird even saying it, but like a silver lining or uh, sort of an, an unintended consequence of being in the middle of a global pandemic is that when people are not working three and four jobs in order to just survive and that folks have actually had an opportunity to sit down and think about their vision for themselves and their communities um, and what they, the bad things that they want to stop, they want to stop, but also the 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 you know their their aspirations uh for themselves in their community and how to actually make it happen i think that that's also a result of this moment that i really am excited um for that story to be told in this particular doc because it is not often told um in the media margin grace i have a question and we also have a question from our audience and it, they're kind of they kind of match up so i'll start and then i'll pick up um uh, Joanne Acarino's question. Uh, so uh, I'm curious what you cut out. I mean, I assume having done similar-ish type projects, you end up with no one's giving you 726 hours to do your project and you've shot a lot. So what, what did you feel like you had to leave behind? And Joanne's question is, my assumption is that you had significant footage representing these incredible women. How difficult was it to select what you ended up sharing with the viewers? Why don't you start for us, Marge? Uh, so literally would have been impossible without our remarkable editor, Julie Vitsa, who may be watching, so hats off to Julie Vitsa. Um, we did, I mean, we probably shot over 400 hours and we have about three and a half, so you can do the math on what was left mm -hmm. behind. Um, you know, I think we just had to come, come constantly come back to our core tenets, right? Our one, which was, are we constantly centering the power and brilliance and just um, kind of joy and labor um, of the women of color? You know, I had an interesting, we did, I did an interesting press interview the other day and somebody asked me, said that they, they had sort of expected that we would see more um, more of the kind of, there's a, there's a, a scene in, early in the uh, project where a reporter kind of um, dismisses the young Bushra Amiwala or where that, a, a guy in Georgia kind of takes Stacey Abrams on about her, her tax uh, debt. And she, and the reporter was asking me, I, th I thought we'd see more of that. And um, for us, it was really important that we didn't center that, that we kept back, came back to constantly centering the power of women and women of color. So that was a guiding principle. Um, and that, and that the story that we told was a story of a movement, you know, so each one of these women merits a documentary, you know, of their own. Um, uh, but how do they intersect in the story of this moment and, and the story of the new American majority, which is sort of the, the kind of the other major character, right, in the film is uh, the relationship between this changing idea, this changing face of America, what we want, um, our vision for a different country, um, and, and where these women sort of came together. But yeah, it was hard. I mean, we cut a long time, maybe a year and a half, so mm -hmm. a lot. So luckily, great. Oh, may I? I'm gonna no, just I was just going to add. Um, yeah, luckily, go ahead, but I want to ask something on the end of that too, but go start for me. Oh, sure. Um, just luckily we have a lot of this footage um, is going to be part of this impact and outreach campaign. So we are working with many different organizations, um, you know, so we can sort of dig into deeper into different groups, you know, with organizers or um, themes that come up, whether it's faith or, you know, organizing within specific communities. Um, and, you know, hopefully these other footages will see another life in, in that mode. So great. And I was going to ask you, um, and she could be next seems to both say to young women of color, this is your time, look at these role models. And also it felt to me a bit of, hey, white dudes, heads up, <laughs> change is coming. Is, is that a fair representation of, of, of how, it, how it came across to you? Um, I mean, I would say like, I've been, I've seen this my whole life, you know, like it, it isn't new. Like the people around me, the communities in which I live 
are predominantly of color. I live in the middle of Los Angeles in Koreatown. It's mostly Asian and Latino, you know, like the leaders that I see are the women and, you know, and she could be next, right? It's, it's not a new story. Um, yeah, but if it is a new story for you, then welcome to our world. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, this question is from uh, John. This question is for Senator Durazo and uh, Representative Glebe. What has surprised you both about your roles? What's great and what do you find challenging? Why don't you start us off, Senator Durazo? Uh, you mean now in, as a senator? Yes, in your, in your gig now. Change, what change? Well, I, one thing that's changed is to uh, try to understand and deal with these incredible details in the legislative process. Um, all these rules and these protocols and what you have to do and how you move your legislation forward. Um, so there's all that to, to be learned and, and that's different. Um, it's now with the pandemic, it's really different because I used to be able to have meetings with all the advocates and all the activists and all, around all the issues and face to face and, and really go back and forth. And that's, you know, the, the, the energy that you get, the inspiration that you get is, is different uh, from today from having to Zoom or just do, do audio. Uh, what's also different is uh, you have to learn what it, about all the people, the members who are voters now, right? All the senators, all my colleagues, who are they? How do they make decisions? How do they vote? Why do they vote in a certain way? We have to learn a, a very different environment. Um, and I um, have spent a lot of, lot of time in my life helping other people get elected. It was completely different to be the elected um, that uh, has to learn uh, uh, who the new players are, who are the ones that make these decisions, and what makes them tick. What makes them concerned about something and not concerned about something else? What makes them care about a domestic worker and not feel like, oh my goodness, I, my power over my uh, domestic worker is going to be lost if I give her health and safety you know, protections now? I mean, what makes people click that are on the floor that are actually voting? That's, a, that's new, but the way to influence them is not new. And so I'm glad I had the life experience of um, raising these issues of immigrants and saying um, uh, immigrants are such a big piece of the backbone of this country. But then you hear on the floor, still, still state senators talking about immigrants as if they were uh, a poison to this country. So these are all changes in the day to day, but in the end, I'm so proud to just know so many, especially women activists who carry on these struggles every single day. That's the part that I'm, I have to make sure that I stay grounded with them. And then everything else is just a short-term learning process. Congresswoman? You know, I, I think, um... Uh, for me, I served six years in the Michigan House, and I kind of had a similar experience as Mary Elena, but what's interesting is um, bringing the, some of that activism in my role as Congress member. You know, people are like, why is a Congresswoman getting arrested for $15 minimum wage increase? I'm like, why not? Uh, you know, so this, this kind of, um, uh, I think when I get to D.C. of this fact that, you know, sometimes you hear people calling it the bubble uh, it is very much a very different world that is completely disconnected with the majority of American people. There is the lack of urgency. Majority of my colleagues are millionaires. They're in an income bracket that is completely um, uh, unf unfamiliar with the fact that, yeah, majority of Americans live check by check, y'all. So when we had the federal shutdown, the, yeah, many of our federal employees were in the food bank line. Or you hear you know, the language that I bring in, and I'm not just talking about, you know, cursing, but I'm talking about just even the language I bring forward of uh, being close to the pain. What do you mean? Uh, uh, <laughs> you. not gonna lie. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but the point is, and say, is that's, that's me outside. That wasn't me on the floor, right? But that's also the fact that so much of us, we, we want to see a action and we bring it in. And even Maria Lynn is talking about like, whoa, that's how they see immigrants. It's almost like you're in this surreal world. And so that's what's so different is 
you know, I expected it, but I didn't expect it, I think, among my own caucus as much. Uh, and I didn't expect, um, you know, I, I remember sitting next to a colleague and he, he was like, how's it going, kid? Uh, and I said, oh, well, uh, you know, think, think, people are not, they don't move quick here. They're reactionary. Like, what's up with that? Like, why are, we know that poverty is an issue. So why, why do we have to continue to study it? We know it's a problem in our country. Let's move forward. And he kind of looked at me with this blank face and he said, oh, I remember feeling like that when I first got here. Like, yeah, there's too much, there's no urgent, there's no movement. And, uh, and he says, don't worry, this place is going to beat it out of you. And oh. I was like, no, I know. And that is what's scary. And so that's what's really important about, uh, you know, I have my legislative work groups in the district. You know, national groups are like, hey, we want to talk to you. I said, well, no, I'm going to call talk to Sierra Club Detroit. Let me check in with them and let me talk to you. Because not to, not to try to discount, but they're so connected with the air quality issue versus maybe national might be fo focused on wildlife and other major issues. But the, the point is, is, is to stay really connected is to make sure the policy and everything stays rooted. So, you know, like Maria Elena knows that energy and that spirit, it gives credibility of what we need to bring forward uh, uh, with us. But it is extremely very much a different world that is so disconnected. It's almost like uh, folks are getting information from this little like tunnel that that m many of us don't know about and we don't know where it's coming from you know some people say it's special interest groups whatever it is um, but to me it's it's it that's why a lot of the things getting introduced now should have been introduced 10 years ago so we're fighting for $15 minimum wage well now you hear people saying that's not even going to go far enough we've been fighting for seven years so it's 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 those kinds of things that as I again I'm on a year and a half there uh, uh, it's very much extremely frustrating. Uh, I didn't expect that. Uh, that's why I come home every week uh, if I do, because I don't want to become numb, but I also don't want to uh, allow that to seep into our work around the policy, the meaningful change that we want to see in so much of the work that we do. Uh, this question is from Anonymous, and NSA really is just a lovely compliment for you, but I'm going to make you answer some of the questions in it too, and then I'm going to open it up to others as well. Uh, NSA is bringing up beautiful points. Uh, do the subjects think that the pandemic and recent events will bring a, ch uh, a chance or growth in voter turnout? Are they worried that it won't? What are the next steps in building momentum? So really it's a, as you were pointing out, some of the impact that we're seeing just currently, what, what do you think is gonna happen? And then I'm gonna ask others to weigh in too and say. Well, we've already seen it. Uh, you know, many of, of you know that there was a primary election in Georgia two weeks ago. And despite the, um, the Secretary of State's attempt to basically take a sledgehammer to our elections infrastructure, um, we saw overwhelming historic turnout in a primary election and you can't take that away. Um, I think that there is going to be a fundamental change, I think, in the culture of voting and how people vote as we prepare for a second wave. I think that folks now saw sort of crazy long lines in, at George, in Georgia. They saw these brand new voting machines, 30,000 new voting machines that Georgia bought that are difficult to navigate, um, running out of paper, glitchy AF, um, poll workers who were not trained, right? Um, the Secretary of State and the governor getting on the news and blaming, saying, you know, well, you know, the average age of a Georgia poll worker is 70 years old. Well, you know, we knew that before election day. Uh, and there's something that we can do about it. And so I think that, yes, this mo there's nothing like, I think, sort of fear and excitement uh, and uncertainty to focus the mind. And so I think we're in, in movements past, um, people would say, go out and vote as a way to quiet folks who are engaged in direct action as a, to you know use it as a sort of blunt force object against people who were protesting in the streets. And now, because I think of how dire the circumstances are, there's a real clarity from the people that are protesting in the streets to the folks that are sitting at home that we absolutely need both. And that, I think, is going to have a tremendous impact on turnout, which also means that we need to keep our eye on the ball and keep our eye on people who administer our elections, because uh, the way to neutralize that increased 
enthusiasm and that increased sort of political education that's happening is to suppress votes. And so we should all be thinking about, you know, what we're going to do to to prevent that from happening um, this November. I always thought voter suppression, it doesn't sound as terrible as it actually is, right? Voter suppression, it sounds quite not bad. Uh, not, you know, vote, it, vote stealing, vote thievery, oh, vote, right? Like there's right. There are tougher ways to frame it. Voter suppression, um, I, I, do you think there's just the, the narrative and anybody else who wants to weigh in on this, I'm curious. Uh, one, does anybody disagree with NSA and thinks that actually this, this p pandemic issues could be more problematic. People in the streets could actually not inspire, but instead have a, an opposite effect. And also around voter suppression, I feel like there's a whole language that has to change in how we teach people about how their own government runs. Well, I say vote theft all the time as well. So thank you for flagging that. And I well, agree. And I'm going to start using that too. How about that? I like that. There you go. I can't remember which one of these brilliant women uh, says it in the film, but um, I'm pretty sure it's one of the three of them that are on this panel with us. Um, as that number uh, demographic is shifting, right, as power is being threatened or the traditional um, sort of what power has looked like is being threatened, there is an increasing urgency for cheating in order to, because, you know, because the numbers are overwhelming now, right? Like the change in America is coming so fast. And, there, and you know, in, if we look at history, but people don't give up power. It's very rare for people to just cede power and say, oh, no worries, I've had my go. Why don't you come along, brown lady? Like, that's not how it works, right? So power has to be taken. It has to be taken by the people um, with, you know, at every level, us on the street, the NSAs who help connect us to a political home and the Rashidas and Marielenas who are willing to run and put themselves out there because, you know, I'm sure, I know that they both get a lot of incoming, right, for being the one, the first, and the ones who stick their, their necks out. Um, so, I mean, I just read a story this morning on the Washington Post about the upcoming Kentucky primary, where I think it said that there are 200 polling locations for the upcoming primary out of a traditional 3,700. Right, exactly right. Right? And then it's a thousand cuts. I mean, say talks about this in, uh, in episode two. Voter suppression is happening in a, in a really, in a thicket, like a network of a ton of small places where they can knock off a couple of hundred here, knock off a couple of hundred here. If you don't get your registration back, it's that poll worker didn't know the answer to your question, so they couldn't inform you. It's the line was too long. It's the power cord didn't work. It's all, all of this stuff. And I think that's what we need to educate ourselves about is it's not like, um, it's not like some shady character coming in and stealing a box of ballots and going and chucking them in the bin. It's not that. It's much more sophisticated. Um, and say has a great line. What's your line about Jim Crow and, and his uh, upgrade? Oh, <laughs> um, well, I, let me also say that there's also taking boxes of ballots and throwing them oh, in the bin. That's a I'm thing. I'm glad that's not happened. That, that's, that's a thing. We're not uh, losing the tradition. Right. Oh, that uh, we are now fighting uh, James Crow Esquire uh, mm -hmm. or James Crow PhD data scientist, um, right? Because of the way that, for example, Georgia purges its voter rolls, uh, taking ethnic names or uh, how it um, disproportionately impacts women and femmes and people who change their names. Um, and, you know, the, they've gotten all kinds of guidance from the Social Security Administration, like don't use our database to purge voters, uh, and they do it anyway. Um, and so, yeah, it has absolutely become more sophisticated. Uh, again, not uh, in place of the traditional, more violent tactics, but uh, in addition to, um, which is also why, you know, the work of defending the vote, again, is starting now as we prepare for the November elections. I'm just going to flag this one point that um, the RNC, uh, there was a consent decree that has expired that said that they can't use any of their resources to like recruit, um, you know, violent protesters or they can't, um, you know, bring have people with weapons come to the polls and like that no longer, they're their hands are no longer bound uh, by that consent decree anymore. Um, and so thinking about um, all of the ways in which we can vote, uh, 
you know, vote by mail and early voting and thinking about all of those strategies now. Um, so that how do we, you know, maintain the momentum, um, but also how do we keep people safe, uh, safe, free from violence that could happen at the polls, safe from um, contracting, you know, coronavirus when you're in line for six hours, like people in Georgia were with hundreds of your neighbors. Um, and so, uh, and and I'm, those conversations are happening now, um, which is a departure from how campaigns um, approach them and discuss them and how, quite frankly, the media uh, has approached them in the past. We were talking about Brian Kemp as the Secretary of State and the candidate for governor for a full year before the governor's race and people didn't actually really cover it until October of 2018 because they wanted to cover it in the context of the horse race. Like, will this have an impact on mm -hmm. the results of the election? Who knows? We know. Yeah. Grace, can I ask you a question about diversity? You, you guys obviously focus on diverse candidates and diverse people's stories, women's stories, but I, I, you also have a, a field team that was all diverse women as well. Tell me a little bit about that. I, I, that was intentional. Why? Why was that important? Um, yeah, it was definitely intentional. I mean, obviously, we're telling an epic political story over an election cycle, um, which is geographically diverse, many parts of the country happening at the same time. Um, and as Marge and I are in the documentary field, just as in politics, it isn't a very representative field either. But we really wanted to, we assembled a, a team of really our peers, accomplished women of color, documentary directors, um, who closely matched, you know, communities and backgrounds of the women that we were following. So for example, um, Yoruba Richin, uh, African-American filmmaker from New York, uh, was in Georgia, the main sort of field director in Georgia, in Los Angeles, Anayansi Prado, I think she's watching right now, was with uh, Maria Elena, um, Amber Ferris, and me, because I knew Rashida, um, in Detroit. Um, you know, you know we, we wanted to make sure that we had people who understood the communities and had, act, you know, had access and, you know, didn't just sort of parachute in and, you know, start looking at these issues for the first time. Um, yeah, and I think, Marielena, we cut you off. You were going to say something about the voting, too, right? Well, I, I just wanted to add, um, there are other ways, of course, in our culture in which there's, quote, unquote, voter suppression. Um, 15, 20 years ago, it was, you know, big white guys standing outside of a polling booth wearing fatigues and, you know, trying to scare, you know, immigrant families who were citizens uh, from voting. Uh, today, um, you know, it's uh, the president talking about adding a citizenship question to the census form. Uh, there, there are so many ways in which our communities, it, it's not just on election day, it's not just the form or not exclusively the form of the ballot um, and, and th that process, but it's also how does your environment invite you or, um, you know, hate you? How does your environment uh, invite you to vote? Or how does your environment say uh, you shouldn't vote because something could happen to a member of your family, if not you, if you vote the wrong way? There could be more deportations, which has been threatened. There, there are so many ways in our culture um, that we then have to remind them, look, this week, the United States Supreme Court made decisions that were favorable to our community. Who would have ever thought that? Who would have imagined that the dreamers in this court, most of them were thinking, that's it, I have to be ready. And they were under the stress of having to leave this country with their families. Uh, but, but somehow I wanna think that it was our continued push, our continued organizing, our continued work on the ground that has, that gets results, that gets results. And they may not be so uh, clear exactly uh, who said what that led to this, but we know as a whole that our movement does get results. So when people are scared, when they're worried about whether or not to fill out the census form or to go vote, we have to remind them that that vote is so powerful that it has changed the direction, has now allowed almost a million young adults to stay in this country. Was it because it was on the ballot? Specifically, no, but it was because we wouldn't give up and there had to be that kind of an impact even on this United States Supreme Court. 
Yeah, there's definitely been a message, I think, of the last few months. And then, of course, ramped up with the protests of, you know, making your voice heard actually does have an impact. I think historically, Americans frequently feel like they're shouting into the wind and nobody cares. The media doesn't care and nobody cares. Um, but you definitely see some changes on that front. I have promised people that I would get to questions and I'm sitting here asking my own questions. So let me get to work. Uh, Daniel Moss uh, says this, we're a few days away from the seventh anniversary of the Supreme Court's gutting of the Voting Rights Act. What efforts are you making to address the travesty of this decision? And what can those of us who are not in public office do to draw attention to this issue? Who wants to tackle that for me? Well, I, I know in Congress we did um, uh, pass a, an amendment to address some of the case law that, that um, the Supreme Court decision. Uh, I do think we can go farther than that and deeper than that, but I, I know we passed it out of the House, but unfortunately it's uh, stuck in the Senate uh, right now under McConnell's leadership. Um, but it's uplifting that uh, work was done with a lot of grassroots organizations and others. Uh, you know, there's this also this fear around um, some coalition uh, folks uh, of, you know, do we want to open up the Voting Rights Act at this moment? Um, because they could make it worse, uh, meaning those that want to continue to suppress our vote or, or steal our votes. Um, and, but, you know, as a per this is where you all come in and speak up. I know in Michigan, we did something really transformative. We went ahead and put something on the ballot uh, that completely, it made it so accessible for us to vote. Um, but we also obviously are still struggling to, you know, what we think in some certain areas that might continue to see uh, voting theft. Uh, but we went and took it to the ballot uh, in our own state. So don't underestimate some movement work that you can do uh, beyond just the Federal uh, Voting Rights Act to strengthen it right in your backyard. Uh, that's where you probably can get clerks and, and state government and others to push and go farther than what they've done on the national level, which is extremely unfortunate. But uh, people don't realize that. They, there is a lot of gaslighting out there and, and, and disconnection with people. And unfortunately, too, people don't think about voting until it's time to vote. And they think about it for that minute and they're next to, they're on to the next broken system, which is healthcare and immigration and education and all these other things. But I would say continue to try to really build a local movement around it. This question is from Brenda Seiler. <clears throat> the font on this chat box is so, so tiny and I don't have my glasses. Uh, within organizing groups uh, and uh, for each, um, Congressman Tlaib and uh, Senator DeRazzo are stressing the importance of responding to the census as another way to impact change. Uh, I'm very curious, actually, for all of you who want to weigh in on this. Um, talk to me about the census. You know, normally, having been in the TV news business for a minute, there's an arc to the census stories, right? And, you know, normally we'd be hitting up the census stories, but that's going to disappear. And census workers are sure not really going to show up to your house. Um, what are your concerns around the census and the impact that it's going to have on this sort of bigger story that you guys are, are doing here, which is really our people of color and women of color specifically saving democracy? Who wants to start for that answer? Well, well uh, I, I, go, go ahead. ahead. Maria Elena, do you, I was just going to say, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to say, we, we in California started like three years ago to think ahead of what was going to be needed to put into place uh, to make sure that we were all counted and went down to uh, into even the smallest communities who are the hardest, hardest to count and invest. And so, you know, the budget's a reflection of your values. We invested uh, several hundred million dollars to be able to, uh, in advance, plan for it um, and still uh, because of a lot of, of issues, including the pandemic, uh, people are still afraid. A lot of the hard to count communities are still not doing it, um, but we're, we're pushing. We're pushing everything uh, to move people uh, forward on that and do what has to be done. Because also it's connected to, of course, them thinking about going out to vote, then, you know, there's so many things that are connected, but um, we also in this, even in this very, very uh, bad economy with, you know, the, the revenues uh, being cut so dramatically, we still put several uh, tens of millions of dollars extra into, into voting, um, 
into encouraging voting, um, making sure that everybody has a mail-in ballot. So there are a number of ways that I think both leading up to as well as as close as we are to making sure. I represent the district that has the lowest percentage of um, uh, self responses in the census in the whole state. We have an enormous amount of work to do in terms of getting everybody to understand how important that, how that results in representation, how it results in funding. Um, um, some, somebody said the other day, well, uh, California is suing um, uh, the federal government and we've, we've won, I think, every single uh, lawsuit, but at the same time, we're begging the president for money. And I just want to say, we don't beg nobody for money. That's our money. It has to be given out uh, um, equally uh, and in the way that it should, fairly and justly, but we do have to work harder on that census. Yeah, and just to quickly add, uh, I think it's really important to know that, of course, it's resources and money, but y'all, we have to stick to that amount of people for 10 years. So if you don't get counted for 10 years, your community lucks out. I always remind people, uh, it's also about class sizes, so you understand. Like, you know, they use that data for class sizes. They use that data of even how, where they even want to study health issues. And, you know, Southwest Detroit, where I was pretty much born and raised, and one of the things there is they, they cut up the district in a way uh, that pretty much cut up the Latino community. And I kept saying, well, it's 60 percent Latino population. They said, no, the census says it's 49. It's, it was like 47 percent. And because of that, they couldn't keep them all in one district. So there is so much at stake um, where, you know, that's what happens. Your voice is diluted. Uh, the resources is diluted. Uh, you end up getting, um, you know, uh, I think a lot of decisions being made, again, with these numbers that last us a decade uh, forever. And so even as we think about these things, it's not just, you know, I think it's about 18,000. I think they increase it, but it says 18,000 per person for your district, but it's, it's the studies, it's the research, it's the class sizes. It's so much more uh, at stake uh, when they look at the census. And so it's, it's critically important. And again, we have to live with those numbers, not like elections every so often, you know, you have another election. This is a one-time deal that we deal with, with for 10 years. As we get close to the five minute mark before I have to wrap up this panel, I wanted to go back to our directors, Marge and Grace, and ask you guys a couple of questions. Um, one thing that I, I liked uh, about the project is I mean, I spent a lot of times covering politics. I was never a political reporter per se, but it always just seemed like a slog. And and there's so much fun and joy and 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 like people enjoying themselves. In the, you know, it's it it doesn't come across as a slog. It comes across as people who want to make the world better. And it was I it actually I was like, oh, this is the people women watching this. I think will say this is something that I should do or I could do. Uh, so my first question would be, what do you want people to walk away from this project with? And also, um, where do we go from here? What What is the next logical step uh, for anybody who's seen the project or even just been part of our conversation today? Marge, why don't you start for me tackling those two questions? And then I'm going to um, ask uh, if you will, Grace, wrap it up for us as well. So the reason that you see so much joy is because brown girls know how to have fun, right? Like that's every one of these, every one of these um, communities lives in joy. And if we don't know that, it's because of who gets to tell whose stories and the wretched stories that are piped through the tube at us about what these communities look like. And that's part of our, you know, Grace and I's little kind of campaign to reframe how, who has um, narrative power on the inside, but also it's what Ense said earlier about cultural organizing, right? That's like super important. Like it matters what music you're playing, what food you're serving, you know, that it's not in some strip lighting, fluorescent, you know, community, you know, like that is what, what's appealing about that to anyone, you know? So I think the fact that maybe this looks different than traditional politics is in fact the reason <laughs> that we focused on this story. Um, and I think that the, the sort of what can we do, um, we can find a political home. So maybe you're really lucky and you have representation in your electeds who, who you feel kinship with. And I'm sure many, many people who are represented by Rashida and Maria Elena feel that way. But maybe you aren't that lucky and you need to find yourself a new Georgia project. You need to find yourself a political home 
which is full of people who, and led by people who look and, and have the same lived experience that you have. And, the, you know, when we just were talking about the census, I mean, I'm relatively well plugged in and it still makes my head spin because it, it's complicated, right? This is not a system, nothing about our political system invites you in to, to celebrate your participation in democracy, right? It's like the other way. It's designed to make you feel stupid. I think I feel stupid a lot of the time when I get my California ballot measures and I have to read them like six times to understand what is actually being asked of me here. So, so folks like Ense and the good work that they do in political homes across the country in every state, they are our sort of connective tissue, right? And we all need to find a political home so that, so that um, there's someone there to help lead us through, through that process. Now I've taken up, Grace, you have three minutes to sell all the other things you got to say <laughs> before we wrap. Once you find, I mean, as you're finding your political home, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, one of the overarching themes of this project is there's an organizer in all of us. Not all of us are going to run for office. I certainly am not going to. Maybe Marge will if I can convince her. Um, if you but, raise money for me, I'll do it. Um, but, you know, so many of us can organize and so many, so many of us all are already organizing. We're moms, you know, we're, you're organizing the school whatever, you know, the church picnic, um, you know, the block party, the neighborhood association. I mean, those skills translate in so many ways that are much more accessible on this hyper local level. Um, and, you know, you can organize other people to find their political home. I mean, every, if everybody who watches this film goes to andshecouldbenext.com and finds the tools in which you can use to sort of talk to other people about, you know, leadership, you know, we made a film about politics, but you know this this what we're talking about is applicable to any industry, whether it's documentaries, law, you know, business, all of these things. And so we're hoping that people really take the themes away and figure out that how they can organize themselves into whatever values that they you know hold. A big thank you to my panelists, uh, Grace Lee and uh, Marjan Safinia, uh, Maria Elena Durazo, the state senator from California, uh, the Congresswoman Rashida Tlaib, and Ense Ufa. Thank you, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for a great conversation. Thank you, Saladad. Thank you, you, you AFI. Thank you, everybody. My beautiful sisters. Thank you.